Perth Linux Users Group, talking Linux and open source. Welcome everyone uh, for uh, Plug today, where um, Graham Boland is here to speak to us all on, on the subject of free software and political campaigning. I've known Graham for many years through UWA and the UCC, and uh, oh yes, I see he's run still running Max. <laughs> <laughs> here you go. Uh, hi everybody. Um, I'm not sure if this is on, um, but uh, sorry. I've got the thing on my ear, right, of course, yeah. Um, so this is a talk on um, James Hensbridge wrote me into doing on um, free software and political campaigning. I'm going to broaden it a little bit to free software and politics because politics is basically everything. And um, quite a lot of this will be talking about my experiences using free software and, I guess, software um, campaigning for the Greens. Um, I'm one of the state co-conveners of the Greens WA. Um, but I'm not pushing a political barrow tonight, so it's examples and I hope that maybe some of you will come out of this and want to get involved in politics of your choice, you know, non-government non organisations or community groups or a political party of your choice, but I'm not pushing any particular political barrow. So, hello. So, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a tale of woe. Um, some of you might remember the drama that happened around the Senate election. Um, so last September there was an election in West Australia. Um, after the count, it came down to one uh, exclusion on a, on a margin of 14 votes that then decided whether um, Scott Ludlam and Palmer, uh, um, Dio Wang from Palmer were elected or Louise Pratt and I oh, the sports party person got elected. Um, and then there was a bit of a saga there. So I'm going to talk about that and just from the perspective of what we can do as free software people to help with our democracy. So the first count of that vote, um, do people know roughly the story I'm telling? Or Yeah, okay. So the first count of the Senate election came down to a critical 14-vote exclusion and we, we figured that out... Um, Everybody figured that out quite quickly. So on that night, people had figured out what had happened and were looking at, you know, whether that result could be contested. Because when you think about it, you know, when you've got one and a half million people voting, um, 14 votes is a very, very narrow margin. So there's a definite um, call to have another look. So on that night, quite a few people were going to the AEC website and grabbing the data and having a bit of a look. And... As a bit of background, the Senate count is done as a single transferable vote election with particular rules. Um, please, for the love of God, if people would stop specifying algorithms in legislation, that would be really nice with no <laughs> alternative um, explanation because uh, legislative language is not the nicest language for a computer programmer. But all of the data there is, um, is there to reproduce the count on the AEC website. So the data that you need pretty much is the party's group voting tickets. So for people, um, uh, that's basically the preferences. So if you vote on that line above the line, um, you're saying that the party that you vote for or that group can, can choose your preferences for you. Uh, or you can fill in the entire section below the line, which, um, you know, you number from 1 to 52 or whatever it ends up being. Um, a vote above the line is basically the same as a vote below the line in it said so that you're delegating that power to fill in the numbers. So we had a look at the, the data there and using nice, happy open source tools, a um, bit of Python, a bit of whatever, you could pull it apart and have a look at the count as it progressed using the AEC's media feed. So the AEC actually publish a, a feed of the vote count as it goes. So you can look for any anomalies in, in the votes as they come in. And the AEC eventually did a recount. But, and the, and the, two, winning, the two last winners changed. So the six senators up for, for re-election, the last two changed. But then they lost some of the votes. This was somewhat upsetting when you considered how much work people had put into, from all the parties, into the recount. 
So then in April 2014, that election was run again from scratch. New candidates, new everything. It was um, legally September 2013, Senate election never happened. But, now this is the really interesting bit that we didn't, um, I didn't have enough time to do anything about um, during the, the recount. The AEC determine who wins the election and who loses the election using a piece of software. So they actually digitise every, every, everybody that votes below the line. If you fill in those 52, 60 boxes, everyone that fills that in, that's double entered. So someone will type in the numbers that you've put and actually they'll note which numbers you skipped as well because your, your ballot can be saved if you skip some numbers. Um, and if you voted above the line, that gets put in a giant bundle of everybody that voted in that group and then those bundles get counted. So that's all then input into a computer system and then um, it flashes lights a bit and emits who won. Um, there's, some, there's some technicalities around that. But basically, that piece of software is closed source. Um, they'll run the count. Uh, the scrutineers from the parties can be there. The candidates can't, but the scrutineers can. So you can witness the software running. It might crash, and then they might run it again. Um, and that's not terribly great, because they'll run that count. You've got 24 hours to contest the result before they declare it. And then if you contest after they've declared it, you end up in the Court of Disputed Returns, which is basically the High Court sitting with another name. Incredibly expensive, you don't want to go there. Unfortunately, there's no time to use the open source, um, to use an open source alternative for the software to verify. So I've written an open source implementation of the, the Senate transferable vote um, algorithm, and I can reproduce the AEC's results. But there's some very good people that have been fighting this particular battle. So I've written an implementation of, of that particular software, but these wonderful people here, there's a collaboration of people that have pretty much been uh, FOIing the AEC to try and get the software, the source code to the software, or at least the source code to the part of the software that counts the result. So I guess this is a little bit of a, a morality tale about um, why free software can matter in politics. It's a, it's a little bit absurd to me that um, that something so important um, c isn't, isn't open and free. And um, I guess the halfway position of, well, okay, but we've, we've re-implemented the software, so given the same inputs, um, we can then check whether your result was correct and contest it if it was incorrect, isn't possible because they don't publish the above the line and below the line data. You need to run the count yourself until after they've declared the result. So... Um, you can, uh, an, an hour or two, actually, I think it was about three hours after, after they declared the result in, in April, where um, I was able to verify the AEC got the answer right, you know, according to my software. But there's absolutely no way that you can, if, if I then said, oh my God, a rounding error has put seven votes over here and the wrong people have been elected, I'm then in the position of having to go to the high court. So, um, just while I'm finishing up on this little, little tale, um, the Senate actually passed a motion. Um, I think it went through pretty much unanimously. All parties voted for it to um, uh, call on the AEC to release the software and the relevant minister, and that's now tied up in something or other. They may or may not do it. So the AEC are claiming that that software is commercial and confidence and part of... Um, part of their um, proprietary voting system that, you know, if, if you're running a uh, student guild election or something, you get them in to do that. Which I, I personally think is nonsense. You get the AEC in because they've got a reputation for honesty and, you know, not being corrupt. You don't get them in because their software's so great. Anyway, um, that's my little open source and politics tale. So, I guess, what is a political campaign? Um, political campaigns... Uh, but more broadly, politics uh, is acting to further your political goals. So that's pretty broad. You've got Electronic Frontiers Australia. You've got Plug. People here probably have shared political goals, maybe um, freedom of information, um, that kind of thing, uh, freedom from unnecessary surveillance, um, from metadata capture. That's probably an issue that resonates pretty well amongst this group of people. Um, so politics is pretty broad which makes this talk pretty, 
broad. And I guess the message I've got is that ICT is pretty much your vital, um, I, know, I know everybody hates the term ICT, but it's pretty much the vital infrastructure for political action in this century. Um, there's other ways of reaching people. There's other really good ways of reaching people. You know, you can knock on their door and talk to them or you can telephone them. But in terms of mass reach, it's really quite up there. Yet people that can do it are pretty rare. You know, all of us can do it. Um, I don't think you get many gatherings of people that would have the skills this group's got. And volunteers in any organisation with those skills and the kind of enthusiasm to use them are pretty rare. So <laughs> I guess the other part to this is pol politics is all about communication. So I just chucked a random XKCD in here. But I guess what I'm trying to say is um, probably most of us here are internet people, so we'll get this joke. Um, if you want to talk to internet people about internet issues, you probably need to be an internet person. You probably need to get this joke and find it funny, or at least, you know, roll your eyes. Um, So I guess I'll give a little bit of an overview of what's out there and maybe some of the problems with it, maybe some of the things that people might be interested in, you know, cracking on and fixing. So if you're running a political campaign, you probably need a big list of contacts. So um, actually a surprising number of organisations are using open source to do this. Um, I shouldn't say surprising. It's pretty, pretty, um, pretty clear that open source is a big winner. Um, your costs are very low financially, but also you've got a lot of tweakability. So um, one of the biggest ones is Civi CRM. It's a little bit clunky now, but it's, um, if people have heard of Drupal, it's a PHP um, web framework. It sits on top of that. It scales out to millions and millions of contacts in your database. You can uh, email them. You can ask them if they'd like to come to your event. You can then uh, you know, follow them up and say, well, you said you're coming to our event. Did you know it's tomorrow? You can, you can do all of that kind of campaigning stuff. Um, and then you've got web, and I guess web is enormous, but a lot of the time you don't want people like us, or necessarily people like us with this hat on, doing your communications and your writing. So a lot of the time you're using content management systems and then you're getting people that have got specific communication skills to do the writing, so that you've got the kind of Drupal WordPress ecosystem. Um, questionnaires and polls, that's a pretty popular way to engage people. Um, it's also pretty terrible a lot of the time. Um, that's actually one of those weird places where everyone says to use proprietary software, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, you can get WordPress to do this, but you know sometimes it's a little bit bad. And social media, I reckon this is something really exciting. Um, most of the popular platforms are closed, but you know Twitter's got a pretty open API, getting less open, unfortunately. Um, you can do a lot with that. You can do a fair bit with Facebook if you want to write applications for it. But I'm, I'm kind of excited about what we can do in terms of um, open source, you know, wider free software social media platforms. Um, unfortunately, all of the attempts so far seem to have failed to differentiate, if you know what I mean. That, you know, a slightly better Facebook or a slightly freer Facebook, in my opinion, is never going to get anywhere because the, the mass of people isn't going to gravitate across just because of abstract concepts necessarily. But maybe maybe that'll get better. My presenter, no presenter notes are not showing up, so I'm sure I'm missing half my talk. Um, but I guess um, f the biggest thing that I've found in political campaigning with free software is that it's really, really nimble. So one thing you have with political campaigns is that you don't really know what you're doing tomorrow or two hours from now. You don't know what opportunity is going to come up. You don't know what problem is going to arise. So I'll go back to that photograph I had on my first slide. So I guess most people would recognise that's a Raspberry Pi and some silly idiot, aka me, stuck a green triangle on it. Um, during the April election, we had a, um, we had a, a little phone banking set up, 16 IP telephones, and we got another 16 from somewhere. And a whole bunch of computers um, which were donated or loaned and pretty much built in two days a call centre with 32 phones, um, an ADSL line with, whose upload was just about full. Um, that was pretty much the limiting factor in the end. And 
click to dial. So uh, our internal CRM, we wanted to be able to, the people that were phone banking, it r rapidly became a, um, a, um, um, obvious to us, but one of the problems was just people having to type the numbers in. So with the Raspberry Pi plugged into the two networks, the data network and the telephony network, and um, a little um, Flask Python program and a Chrome plugin, or Chromium actually, we were able to, you know, in 12 hours work or whatever, go from people having to type to people being able to click on a link in the phone next to them dialed. Now, that's not super impressive, but I think the time and the turnaround is where it gets, um, gets cool. So other things that you can do with um, free software, um, probably this is where I reckon free software is completely dominant, is unlocking data and using it to, um, to campaign. So there's a heck of a lot of geospatial data out there. And you can do mashups between things like, um, uh, say you want to characterise who votes for a political party. You've got the 2011 Australian Census out there. Um, slightly ridiculously, the, um, I actually ended up in the media for this accidentally. Um, the uh, AEC website has a, a minified JavaScript function. Uh, not AEC, ABS, Australian Bureau of Statistics, has a minified JavaScript function, which hilariously enough, if you just load it and paste it into to Node with an eval around it, it just prints out everything, including the comments. And the comments actually say, this is, you know, things like, uh, this magic number on the end of the URL is intended to make it look like it's, um, you know, you can't automatically download all this data. They've actually gone to, to effort to, to try to make it difficult for people to um, bulk download all of those um, zip files of, of data on people. So from the census, you can get things like um, in every block of two or 300 houses, um, how many people are there? How many male people? How many women? Uh, how many people that migrated from the United Kingdom or from um, India or from Indonesia? How many people are there that... Um, are employed or unemployed or um, work in this industry. There's a huge, number, a huge amount of data in there. How many people caught public transport on the day of the census? So it's possible to, to, to map this. I wrote a little tool here, um, EOGIS, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff in this space, but this one I specifically have a census loader for. And I've got the whole census, and thanks to the ABS for making it Creative Commons, I just stuck it in a giant 7-zip file, and it's all XZ archive and it's um, on Dropbox. So don't bother with the ABS website. Um, so if you grab that tool, you can actually just um, start plugging in formulas and start visualizing, you know, what percentage of people in this little bit of the bit of the city speak Italian, or whatever strange question you want to ask about the place you live in. Where this gets a bit interesting is then you can start going and grabbing other data like. Um, uh, uh, who, you know, uh, how many people voted for the Greens at this polling booth, you know, and then you start correlating that with um, demographic information or how many people voted for the Liberal Party or how many people voted for, for um, X. That's one thing you can do. But there's also a lot of economic information that's published. So if you want to start asking questions, um, one question I've been meaning to ask and answer for a while is um, how... Um, can you compare public transport availability with average income? Because I think it's pretty clear in Perth that the public transport system is largely set up for um, middle income commuters. You know, it's not really set up for people on the urban fringe. And you could maybe ask questions about, you know, is that moral? Is that ethical? Is that what we should be doing with public transport? So one thing that we can do as free software people is use free software to open data. So there's a lot of data out there that's really interesting and almost, oh, I wouldn't say it's deliberately, but sometimes lazily published in formats that are painful. So I'll pick on Corrective Services WA here. Um, they publish prison statistics and you'll, uh, you might know that um, because of some policy changes in Western Australia, the prison population has actually grown quite a lot. That data is actually in PDFs. Um, <laughs> So it's very hard for the NGOs in this area. Um, I, won't, I won't name them because I, I should, probably shouldn't, but um, there are particular NGOs that would be particular, um, particularly interested in this, some of the social services NGOs or um, 
uh, social justice organisations or legal services. They'd be very interested to know um, exactly, you know, how has the pro prison population changed? There's actually quite a bit of demographic information there. But unfortunately, it's published month to month as a PDF and nobody's actually helped them out and unlocked it. So that's something we can all do with free software that will we can then stick that script up on GitHub. Um, you can you can literally email an organisation and say, I would like to do this thing for you, or I've done this thing for you, here's the data, what can I do to improve this? Um, if you were to contact a local MP about your issue and say, how can I help? Um, there's a lot you can do. So probably my first political action using free software was um, uh, former MP for East Metro, Alison Zamon. Uh, she, one of her portfolios was um, fracking, oil and, oil and gas, but um, fracking is um, uh, extracting oil and gas that's um, uh, unconventionally, you know, in unconventional reservoirs, and that's got some risk to the water table and that kind of thing. Um, I, I saw a presentation she'd done on that, and then she was saying that she was finding it very difficult to just, you know, get the data that's out there and just put it on a map. So with some open source software, um, Map Server or this Geo Server, th those are two free software packages that will take um, shape files or other geospatial information, chuck them on top of a of a, of a web overlay. Um, you can have point data or polygon data or whatever you've got. You can colour by values and attributes. You can. I was able to pretty quickly. I think it was in about a day. Um, make a little interactive website for them that showed all the whales. Um, the Department of Mining and Petroleum actually published this data. You can, um, you have to create an account, but it's free, you know, probably not redistributable, but it's available monetarily free. Um, and chuck it on the map. And then from that you can, you know, can start showing people, did you know that this well in the southwest is on the list for fracking? Did you know that this well up near Broome, you know, in the tourist area is up for fracking or has been fracked? So, I guess my little thing that I'm harping on about is uh, you'd be very surprised just how valuable all of us can be to organisations that, you know, uh, whatever your political views are, there'll be an organisation you can help with and use free software and convert them to that idea. And I'll just give a bit of a shout out to these organisations. I'm pretty sure they all, or little groups, they all, um, they're all free software. They're probably all on GitHub. Um, below the line is Benno Rice, um, he's a pretty great guy. He um, made a website, uh, I was talking before about Senate voting, so you've got your 50 odd slots, whatever it is, I think in New South Wales it's getting up towards 100, it's getting a bit ludicrous, below the line, or then you can choose one, one slot above the line, so you can vote for whichever party you like, you know, Socialist Alliance or the Pirate Party or the Liberals or whoever you choose. Sorry? The taxi driver. I don't think they ran in Western Australia last time, but uh, you can vote for whichever one of those parties above the line, and then they get the choice of where your 90 odd or 80 or whatever it is preferences below the line go. And that's not necessarily great because they might be doing deals you've got no idea about. Um, Benno made a website which let you quite quickly build your your um, ballot paper, you could print out a dry run ballot paper and just take it in and obviously you can't post that in the box but you just transcribe it and you don't have all those worries about putting eight twice or whatever and invalidating your ballot. That actually wouldn't invalidate the ballot but you get the idea. Um, election leaflets at org.au, um, you've probably all seen uh, that you get stuff through your mailbox during an election campaign. You know, um, Palmer might give you a DVD or um, the Greens might stick a piece of paper through your mailbox, although we do that less than we used to. Um, Liberal and Labor both do huge amounts of it. It's a really cool site. What they do is um, they get people to just scan in the material that they get and upload it, and it's all there. So I think that's really cool, both from a kind of nerdy librarian sense of things. You know, it's nice to have that material for posterity, and of course, after an election, you should all post that material to the ephemera collection at your library, but um, it's also really cool from a transparency point of view because some of this material is only put into a few hundred mailboxes and maybe a lot of people don't know about it. So that's cool. And democracysausage.org is one of my favourites. It's actually something my housemate is involved in 
and it's just, um, I don't know if you've, um, you go and vote and there's often a PMC sausage sizzle at a primary school. This is a um, little website that just maps out where all those sausage sizzles are. So it's kind of cool. I, I like it. You know, you know if you're going to vote, you might as well vote and have a, you know, low quality cold sausage. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, th that's probably my talk. Get involved, whatever your political pr presentation. Um, persuasion. So, yeah, anyone have any questions? Any of them pay. Um, for specific projects, I think you'd find quite a few organisations would pay. Um, I, I think a lot of organisations are volunteer-based. If, you, if you're looking at some of the... Um, uh, I'm not going to name any names because I can't really, but... Volunteer in general skills is one thing, but when doing what they need might take an entire week of eight-hour days, it, it becomes incre increasingly more difficult to help them if they have no money. <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a real problem. And I, I guess it's actually um, less than helpful as well when people half do things. Um, or um, I guess it depends on the organisation. It also depends on your own motivation. Like in, in my case, I chuck quite a lot of time into this stuff because I feel quite passionately about it. Um, but I realise not everybody can do that. Um, but there's, there's actually quite a lot of low-hanging fruit, to use an expression I use too much. You know, sometimes if you care, just if you're just really fired up about one particular issue, maybe you go crack some data open, write a submission to a Senate inquiry or whatever. You know, small steps and you, can, you might get a little bit of um, positive feedback from doing that. You might feel like you changed something. You can, you can change things. So, um, yeah. Some, yeah, often, often there is money eventually, but um, I guess most of what I've been talking about is volunteer based. Oh, oh. Do you know anything about the other organisations, the other political parties and the size of the teams that they have to do this stuff? Um, I reckon the bigger parties probably just pay for it. Um, I don't know that terribly firsthand, but if you've got more money, you can, you can, you can just pay. Um, I think middle tier political parties um, will, will occasionally pay, or uh, the Greens has a paid IT staff, it's not very big, and a, a huge volunteer organiser, uh, um, a huge volunteer crew of IT people that are spread all over the country, which is, you know, you don't need to be physically in the same place very often. Um, but I think some of the other parties are quite interesting. You've got the Pirate Party, which is basically a party full of, of hacker types, and they do, they do some really interesting stuff. Most of their codes are from GitHub. You know, anyone can go and grab it. Um, yeah, I... I I don't know. I suspect the really small micro parties just don't do anything. Um, you know, the, I mean, Mark was just picking, picking on the taxi drivers, you know, but those sort of parties probably don't do much with IT other than just making a website. Um, yeah. I know there's been a number of... Um pushes to try and get governments to release more information in accessible formats. Are there particular departments which seem to be making things more difficult than you'd like, which you'd like to see them change? Oh, um, <laughs> I'm just speaking for myself, um, uh, I don't know. I, I think there's a surprising amount of data that's out there we just haven't cracked, if you know what I mean. Um, I, I've written articles for Crikey and... Um, and the Walkley magazine just looking at WikiLeaks even, and that's an incredibly, um, they dump everything on the internet, they dump everything on BitTorrent. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of the time it's actually, there's a snow of information and the problem isn't really getting it, it's, um, it's filtering through it. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of work we can do, do there. Um, I can't think of anyone to kind of name and shame as being obstructionist. I think, it, I think it's, um, who is it that did, does anyone remember there's a there's a website now in Australia where you can when you put an FOI request in you, yeah right to know 
So you just, you just put your FOI request on this website and it can be tracked through. And the great thing there is you get support from other people that have been through the FOI process. So if the department comes back and says, um, no, we're not giving it to you for this reason and that reason just looks a bit wrong to you, you know, a little bit unjustified, um, often there'll be people that'll know what the next step is or maybe another person will do another FOI. If, you, if your initial FOI wasn't quite correctly phrased, someone else can just try again you know, tweak a bit or home in. Um, quite unfairly, the people that were um, FOIing the AC um, uh, source code for the, for the Senate count and also for the, the reps count, you know, that software which determines who wins an election, um, were actually accused by the AEC of um, vexatiously filing FOIs. <laughs> and um, I, I think that was ridiculous, you know, that, that they were just trying to get to something that, I, in my view, they have every right to. Um, yeah. The AC, I'm not sure if you've looked at Right to Know recently, but um, there's a nice loophole in the freedom of information laws that uh, allow them to not respond if uh, they decide to decline. Um, so. If you have a look on Right to Know, the most recent ones just have no responses other than the auto-generated uh, receipt. Uh, <laughs> it worked for a while. Do you, do you, um, um, do you remember the, um, the guy called um, Dan Nolan in Sydney, the coder guy? Um, he decided to make a, a browser plugin called Stop Tony Meow. So anytime there's a photograph that just uses a very simple algorithm, I think just something like Tony or Abbott in the, in the image URL, it's pretty basic, but it's quite hilarious. It, it replaces any photograph of Tony Abbott that matches its little algorithm with a, with a picture of a kitten sourced off Flickr. Um, that, that's a pretty funny little um, uh, web hack that he did. But the really cool thing is he then FOI'd the Prime Minister um, and Cabinet Department for any mention of Stop Tony Meow in their emails. We <laughs> ended it up with this hilarious email trail of, um, you know, the, their reaction of horror to um, this quite popular browser plugin that was replacing um, a prime minister with images of cats playing with yarn and so on. So <laughs> I'm not saying that you necessarily want to do that kind of thing, but there's quite a lot you can do. Um, so, yeah. Oh, I think that's it. It's a comment. It's uh, important to exercise these freedoms sometimes. Uh, people claim that something is open and published, but you never know until you actually try to get hold of it. And uh, I'm thoroughly impressed by the amount of that you've got, uh, managed to do. Thank you. Oh, cheers. Mm. Actually, one thing that um, I reckon would be a cool project while I'm, while I'm dropping projects on people as ideas um, would be something that just grabs, um, goes to every minister, MP, um, uh, you know, every portfolio holder, go to their website and just grab every media release, you know, do that once an hour and um, grab everything that's linked from it and then just keep it in an archive. Because you'd be surprised how often releases go out that, you know, that then they, they come back and they say, um, oh my God, you know, um, we didn't mean to put that out. And um, for, for journalists, that'd be a really useful tool. There's, um, there's other things that you can do. There's quite a lot of, um, actually, this is probably one of my pet, um, pet things, there's quite a lot of data that's put out monthly and then they just overwrite the previous copy. So um, there's a lot of um, governance and transparency data where that happens, you know. So that data is available, but they might give you the list of current lobbyists. They might give you the list of, um, of people that are currently disclosing a register of interest. But they, you know, um, when that's updated, you know, whatever the update frequency is, the, the previous versions just vanish into the mist. And while you might be able to go to the parliamentary library or something and get them, they're not, they're not on the internet, they're not accessible. And often where you find interesting patterns and interesting things that are happening is when you look at what's changing, not at what is. So um, some of those things, uh, you know, it's a little bit out of scope of this, um, this thing, but I guess it is political. You know, those, um, those things are very interesting to journalists and... Um, Unfortunately, just like political parties, you know, um, journalism doesn't have a lot of people with the skills of this group of people. So those are things that you can do that, you know, just, just ask a question and take a punt and maybe you find something interesting. Um, I personally, um, I, I got a little bit interested in WikiLeaks when I read about it in the press. You know, I 
you know, when the cable, when cable gate happened, I don't know if anybody, if you know about that, that was, um, that was the um, disclosure by WikiLeaks of a lot of diplomatic cables they got from, you know, um, allegedly got from Chelsea Manning. Um, those cables, um, they were releasing them on their website, but they were also as a backup strategy because uh, their website get, kept getting closed down. They were releasing them as BitTorrent archives and they were releasing them about every four hours. So I just downloaded all of the archives I could find off, um, off the torrent sites just using the magnet links and then loaded them into a Mercurial repository or Git. No, I think it was Mercurial. Um, and then um, just ran diff over time. And I found that, you know, they might have said, um, Mr. Graham Boland told the Americans about this thing that was happening. And that might be in an early version of the cable that the WikiLeaks people had put out. And then they'd be Mr. XXX in a later version. But they had disclosed Graham Boland's name, um, just not in the latest version. And, you know, um, the question there was, A, have they endangered Graham Boland? But B, why are they not telling people that they're changing information after the fact? And that was my little thing that got, got published and was a little bit fun. Um, and that was just curiosity and um, using a bit of open source software. So, and again, because I've cheekily broadened the, the talk to poli poli uh, politics rather than just political campaigning, you know, it's all political. Anyway, I think everybody is sick of hearing me, so. Thank Thanks. you very much, Graham. Thanks.